So, uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, panel on the understanding private debt. And uh, we have four panelists. This is uh, a non-standard uh, AFA session. Uh, let me briefly introduce them. So, Steve Kaplan and Jeremy Stein, this being an academic conference, of course, need no introduction. And among many other things, uh, Steve's contribution in private equity space and Jeremy's contribution in financial intermediation and uh, financial fragility, had, their work has been very influential. And so, I thought that they would be the right people to lead this discussion on the private debt. Now, uh, this being a space that grew over the past 10 years and being a space that is actively changing, we couldn't do a good job without help of practitioners. And uh, we, we are thrilled to have with us two of very experienced and prominent investors in the space. The closest to me is Edgar Lee. Until very recently, Edgar, Edgar was with Oak Tree. He was the uh, CEO and CIO of the uh, special opportunities uh, within, within Oak Tree. And of course, Oak Tree is one of the major players in the credit space, in the alternative credit space. Now, uh, farther away from me is Todd Polvino. Many of you might know him from his academic, uh, part, academic part of his life, but uh, Todd is the principal and co-founder of CNH Partners, which is an affiliate of AQR. And uh, what they do is rather different on a different scale from what uh, Oak Tree does. And I'll let Todd explain to you uh, what exactly they do in this space. But they're also actively thinking about the credit non-bank uh, alternative credit space. So the way it's going to work is that uh, all of our panelists will prepare some uh, remarks, and uh, they will go exactly in the order that they're sitting, starting with Steve. After, uh, perhaps after the Steve presentation and Edgar's presentation, we'll gather some thoughts, uh, some clarifying questions. But otherwise, we'll delay until later to have an open discussion uh, about uh, with the audience. One thing that you should be aware is that. We cannot see you very well because there is a bright light projected toward us, so we can only uh, see rough outlines of people. So please, when you uh, ask a question, uh, introduce yourself. All right, and so let me just briefly start by defining at a very high level uh, what is private debt. Because in an academic space, of course, if you pick up in a paper and it says private debt, almost certainly it means non-public debt, bank debt, right? And so this is not what the session is about. And uh, more closely, you're probably familiar with this uh, through the newspapers. And a lot of uh, news been coming out about pension funds uh, uh, and endowments investing in the credit space. Now, this fund structure is actually one of the pockets of what became known as a private debt. Now, taking a step back, uh, if we think about non-bank private debt, uh, I, I thought that the right way to split it is stuff that is originated by these new non-bank entities, and stuff is that is still originated by bank, but in some way is uh, consumed by the alternative investor. So staying on the directly originated side, this is the first, the previous slide that was highlighting new pension funds investing in the credit space. This is what, where most of it goes. This, would ha this type of vehicles would have a traditional fund structure. Think about private equity. This is a, exactly, a, exactly like a private equity fund. But there are several strategies, and our panelists will highlight for you differences among the, dif these different strategies. For example, there is a, the direct lending strategy, something that's been the fastest growing segment within that bigger space of uh, fund structured alternate private debt investment. Similar to what we see in real estate, where REITs are the publicly traded vehicles, in the private debt space, again, in the originated, privately originated uh, debt space, there is what is known as business development companies, or BDCs. And again, the difference between the upper bucket and lower bucket is the upper one is goes into the illiquid structure that has a long-term life whereas BDCs is something that will be publicly traded. Now, on 
the side that is originated by banks but is purchased by uh, non-bank private intermediaries are, of course, the collateralized loan <coughs> obligations. And in terms of the footprint of C loans in the leverage segments, it's comparable in size to the buckets that we outline in terms of traditional fund structure. Now, as Edgar thought with highlight for you, actually in the industry, when people talk about private debt, they don't include the CELO structures in it. Uh, the common argument that I hear for not doing that is because leveraged loans are traded, and so it's a very different asset. In my views, another obvious uh, distinction between those is that once it's originated by these alternative intermediaries, whereas the other one is not. And more broadly, the, everything that is directly originated is, of course, uh, not rated and is highly, as I already mentioned, highly liquid. I'm giving you a reference point for BDC of the yields that you would expect, but generally anything on that side will be a higher yield than, than, uh, than uh, for example, uh, bonds. Now, investment grade bonds. Now, uh, on the C low side, you have to be, the loan has to be rated to get into the structure, and so it's the collateral for CD logos is typically non-investment grade. And um, over 85% of CD logo tranches are non-investment grade. This is a very important typo on my slide. All right, so what I wanted to highlight for you is that in this presentation, we will be uh, focusing actually on the directly originated part. We will bring the leveraged loan market in the conversation for a couple of reasons, and you will see how panelists will tie those topics together. On the superficial level, players like, for example, AOC3 are actually very active in the CLO market as well. So at the superficial level, you can see firms that do all type of the credit uh, activities acting on the directly originated and indirectly originated. So that's one question outstanding. But we don't want this to become a conversation about the leveraged loan market in itself. As you're well aware, the leveraged loan market is at the center of the attention. Whether it, an important question uh, that is outstanding is whether there is a risk building as a result of weakening of credit standards in the leveraged loan market. We don't want that to become our discussion. We're actually interested in this as a shadow banking segment that is continuing growing very fast, and this is a directly originated piece of it. And the question there is, of, uh, are of course, uh, what is driving the growth? Uh, 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 what is ultimately the doing that the banks or public market cannot do? And finally, is this a source of concern for financial fragility? With that, I'm going to pass this to Steve Kaplan. Well, thank you, Victoria. And uh, I'm going to sort of flesh out some of the things that Victoria talked about. So uh, I will repeat what is private debt. Victoria just told you. Then I'm going to give you some facts. And then I have a bunch of questions that I think are interesting and potentially researchable. And I think there, there have been some papers that have been done recently, and I cite them at the end, but I think there's room for a lot of research here, and partially, as Victoria said, because this market is relatively new and has been growing at a very, very strong pace. Okay, so what is private debt? It's not traditional bank debt. It's not traditional bonds. Uh, it includes CLOs in the large level loan market, and then what we're really focusing on more here are the direct lending funds, the BDCs, uh, et cetera. Now, the thing that, that's actually worth mentioning, I'm going to show you a lot of data, and the data come from different places, but none of this data is really like exactly right, and you'll see the numbers don't always agree, and even, yeah, I, I I have a friend who said, you know, she was at the Fed and the Fed was saying, we really don't know exactly what is going on. So I'm going to show you some numbers and just realize that it is, it is opaque. I think there's potentially some double counting, um, but we don't know and there's probably an opportunity to figure that out. So this is uh, picture number one and uh, you can see that uh, high yield debt has kind of come down uh, in the last several years, 
uh, leverage loans have continued to go up and that green line, which is uh, the bottom one there, has just gone straight up. So the estimates here, which are, I think, relatively consistent, have private debt as uh, you know, coming from kind of nothing or a third of uh, the other two to the point where it's probably you know, a half or maybe two thirds of the other asset classes. So the leverage loans and the private debt have really increased over time and they've, they've probably displaced a little bit uh, the high yield debt. Uh, this is another view at, uh, which puts leverage loans together with uh, you know, of all kinds. And again, you see the, the high yield debt uh, has kind of come down in the last five years and the leverage loans continue to increase substantially. This is both true in uh, the US and in Europe. And the other thing about leveraged loans, which is interesting, and this, this includes, you know, unfortunately you've got the, this includes the CLO type stuff as well as the direct lending type stuff, is that banks provide less of this than they used to. And the, uh, the non, uh, you know, kind of the, the banks are now like a third of what's going on here as opposed to the non-banks. So this is just a look at CLOs, which I think I will uh, skip because it's not our focus here. Uh, this is another view of the market. This has the, the leverage loan market at about 1.2 trillion, with CLOs about half of that, which leaves half of that for uh, other things. And again, all these numbers are somewhat different and it just gives you a sense that nobody knows exactly what the right numbers are. Uh, this is a view, again, of the investors in leveraged loans. And this, again, shows you that banks are not the big players here, that the big players here are now institutional investors. So you've seen money leave the banking system or the, the lending leave the banking system and go somewhere else to a shadow banking kind of system. Uh, this just tells you there are a lot of people doing this now uh, and uh, it's increased over time. So now let me go into what Victoria wanted us to talk about more, which is the direct lending funds and the BDCs. And these, these funds more or less compete with each other. They're two different uh, models of funds that do this and they invest largely in the senior loans of middle market companies and the middle market in the US would be defined as companies with sales between 10 million and a billion uh, EBITDA usually below a hundred million and the private means that the borrower is private uh, BDCs obviously, uh, or sorry, refers to the instrument rather than the borrower. There are public companies that can use private debt, uh, and but it is typically the borrowers are typically private, and the lenders. If it's a BDC, they, those can be public. If it's a private credit fund, they're private. Um, a large <coughs> fraction of these loans come from deals. So these can be private equity deals, these can be M&A deals, but a large fraction of them do come from deals and that sort of distinguishes them from the bank lending market, which is more uh, loans to ongoing businesses. The other thing about these funds, whether it's the direct lending funds or the BDCs, is that they tend to be leveraged and the leverage you know, can be, you know, 0.5 to 1, which would make it 30% uh, leverage. They can now go up to 2 to 1 leverage. Not many have, but legally they're allowed to do that. Uh, this is a look at assets under management of these funds, and you can see they've gone, you know, in this uh, estimate from 200 billion in December of 08 to uh, almost 800 billion dollars uh, at the beginning of uh, 19 and uh, that likely has increased since. So there's been a big increase and that's a big asset class. 
this is sort of divides it up between the different types of funds. And uh, the direct lending funds have taken an increasing share of the LBO debt. So again, going from less than a third to uh, about 60%. So that is direct lending funds and BDCs. The BDCs, as Victoria mentioned, are a little bit different. They're, they have some REIT-like characteristics. And uh, what do they need to do? They have to invest at least 70% of their assets in domestic companies that are not publicly listed or that have a market cap less than $250 million. So they need to be smaller companies. They have to disclose everything on a quarterly basis. And uh, as long as they distribute 90% uh, of their taxable cash flow, uh, they're treated as a, a regulated investment company, which is essentially a REIT for tax purposes. And a lot of these BDCs are publicly traded. Uh, many of them are related to private equity firms, Apollo, Ares, New Mountain, TPG. And uh, these are the funds where legally they're allowed to leverage up two to one, used to be one to one, and it'll be interesting to see if they you know, get to the two to one leverage. And it's a picture of assets. So you know, the question is why has this increase in private debt happened? And uh, there's a nice white paper by Ares, uh, which is one of the big participants in this market, and they argue that uh, the high current yields are attractive to investors. Uh, they're good risk adjusted returns. Uh, they argue there are better lender protections. Uh, there's low correlation with other assets. And that part of the reason for this is that the banks have consolidated so they don't play in the smaller loan market. And they've also been affected by uh, regulation. And uh, this gives you at least one view of the returns to these funds. And uh, the median return is roughly 10% uh, net of fees, which, uh, you know, if that's true, has been attracted to a lot of institutional investors. Uh, the other thing to recognize with private debt is it has moved along with the huge increase in private capital. So as the private equity market has increased substantially, that's the blue uh, bars there, uh, the private credit market has come along with it. And that's natural because the private debt is funding a lot of private equity deals or the debt portion of it. And uh, it's fundraising, dry powder. Again, all these are just views that there's a huge amount of private capital out there. So this is not likely to stop. It's likely to continue. And when we ask, when investors are asked, what do they intend to invest in going forward? Um, more investors, the bar on the, uh, uh, the second thing there is private debt. Investors are likely to say, we are going to put more money into private debt uh, rather than less. And uh, along with private equity, institutional investors are saying we are putting more money in, so this is likely to continue. So that is a bunch of data, which just tells you that this asset class has increased, and also should tell you it's a little bit of a mess in that nobody has really put it together properly. I tried here, uh, but there's a lot of work to do. So what are some questions that are worth thinking about? You know, what are the actual AUMs for the different groups? And so you've got CLOs, you've got banks, you have BDCs, you have the direct lending funds that are not BDCs, and it would be nice to really know how much money is in all those groups. And the tricky part is the banks provide some of the leverage for the BDCs and the direct lending funds so that there's potentially some double counting that I think is in the official statistics. Uh, second question, why have the different types of private debt replaced the banks in the high yield bond market? And is it regulatory? Is it a production function? Um, don't know. And uh, there's some work that's been done on that uh, initially. Uh, 
Um, why have the banks and the CLOs given up the middle market lending space to the BDCs and the direct lending funds? And then, you know, there's a, a question that's interesting. The BDCs and direct lending funds are basically, you know, it's equity finance with some leverage, but the, the equity finance is at least, you know, let's say 50% or more. Um, they're sort of doing what banks do, but they're using a lot more equity than banks. So does that say something about the specialness of banks or banks not being, um, not needing to be so leveraged. Uh, next question, do the loan contracts differ from other loan contracts? And what explains the variation in those contracts? Uh, I don't think anybody's really looked at those contracts yet. Um, yeah, related to that, what covenants or terms are most heavily negotiated? Next, where do the, I, I've told you that the BDCs and direct leverage funds uh, are leveraged themselves. Uh, where do they get the leverage from? Some of it comes from banks, but not all of it. And uh, should we worry that we've got leverage on leverage, or is that okay? And then the big question that uh, Victoria mentioned uh, about systemic issues is what's going to happen in the next downturn? Uh, the CLOs were there in the uh, financial crisis. The BDCs and direct lending funds have gotten a lot bigger since then. And uh, is that gonna be a problem or not? Uh, there's a recent report by the Financial Stability Board, uh, which is actually worth reading, uh, which makes the case that uh, risks have been heightened. And uh, it's a question that uh, we will find the answer to at some point. And then the last question is related to uh, who sponsors the BDCs and direct lending funds. A lot of them are sponsored by the private equity funds and the direct lending funds are lending to private equity deals. So is there, you know, are there any conflicts there? And uh, how, do you, how do the firms actually deal with that? And uh, I think I will, I've got a lot of papers there. So uh, if any of you um, are interested or authors of those papers, um, there you go. And uh, I think I will stop there and turn it over to Edgar. Thank you, Steve. Well, good morning, and thank you for having me as part of the session. Steve provided a tremendous amount of data on the private credit investment universe and posed many interesting questions to consider. I'm going to spend the next several minutes focusing on two questions in particular, the first being, what value do direct lenders offer that banks and public markets don't or can't? And the second question is, will the private debt manager space remain fragmented or will consolidation and scale be the path forward? So let's start with the first question and look at four main ways in which direct lenders can provide differentiated value to borrowers. The first is that direct lenders have greater flexibility to finance non-traditional needs for non-traditional borrowers. As noted on this slide, direct lenders don't face stringent lending regulations, and instead, their lending activities are limited by their investment mandates, which often provide tremendous flexibility. Since direct lenders originate and hold loans, they focus on underwriting long-term risk uh, and access significant amounts of non-public information. They use this work to develop customized solutions for borrowers that also reflect a lender's risk-reward appetite. In contrast to direct lenders, banks have been subject to a significant amount of regulation, such as the Shared National Credit Program. Uh, these rules allow for some unusual outcomes, such as allowing banks to lend to businesses in decline, uh, such as Yellow Pages and uh, newspapers while making it more challenging to lend to high growth industries such as software or life sciences. However, even if regulations were changed, it's not a foregone conclusion that banks would change their conservative lending behavior. How do we know? Well, over the past couple of years, the current administration has rolled back certain bank lending regulations. And anecdotally speaking, we haven't seen a dramatic increase in lending competition from banks. So what else is influencing banks? Part of the answer lies in what banks do with large loans. 
Typically, banks syndicate large loans to other institutions, such as CLOs and mutual funds. The syndication process can produce large fees and high returns on equity for banks. However, if it's not done correctly, banks can get hung with loans and lose billions of dollars. During the financial crisis, banks lost over $4 billion on a single loan to Clear Channel Communications. And today, despite being in a very strong credit market, banks are hung with over $2 billion of loans today. In order to reduce syndication risk, banks tend to shun unique loans and, and favor loans that are more plain vanilla and that will generate mass market appeal. <coughs> Similar to bank lending, the bank lending market, the bond market has specific requirements which also limit their flexibility. For example, unlike loans, banks include certain prepayment penalties and these prepayment penalties can add significant costs to M&A transactions. Also, bond investors strongly prefer issuances to be at least $250 million in size in order for these issuances to be included in major high-yield indices. But many middle market companies don't have a need for a financing of this size. Lastly, unlike direct lenders, bond investors will not access private information uh, that could help reduce a company's cost of debt capital. Bonds are governed by securities laws, which limit ability, the investor's ability uh, to trade bonds once they've accessed this material non-public information. The second benefit of direct lenders is certainty. Once a direct lender completes their diligence and decides to lend money to a company, they provide a binding commitment letter. This binding arrangement allows the borrowers to have certainty to their cost of capital and the structural terms of their loans. Banks also provide financing commitments. However, their commitment papers include something called flex, which allows banks to change their committed terms up to certain limits if they struggle to syndicate the loan. So instead of giving certainty to borrowers, banks are actually creating uncertainty for borrowers. The banks ask for flexibility in several, uh, several areas, including one, pricing, two, covenants, and three, uh, material adverse effects and regulation. This last carve-out can be particularly onerous. In 2004, three Wall Street banks walked away from their financing commitments to KKR-backed Brinkman because the financing wouldn't pass certain regulation, regulatory tests. Now, if banks need even more flex, they can lean on companies to get additional concessions. Companies typically share some of the bank's pains in order to preserve bank relationships and assure a successful syndication. A failed syndication could cause a company to be seen as damaged goods by the marketplace, which can affect their future financings. The bond market offers similar levels of uncertainty. The market can experience meaningful periods of volatility, and as a result, borrowers issue when the market is ready for them, as opposed to when they are ready for the market. All of this uncertainty is too much for many companies, which is helping drive the use of the, credit, uh, the private credit markets. The third benefit of direct lenders is expediency. Execution of direct loans can be quicker and far less labor intensive. Why is this? Well, direct lenders originate and hold loans, as opposed to undertaking lengthy syndication processes. Direct loans can take as little as three weeks to diligence and fund, and since these loans typically involve one to six lenders, the diligence process and loan negotiation process is much more streamlined. In addition, direct lenders don't require other materials such as consolidated audits, credit ratings, or SEC filings. In contrast, banks in the bond market utilize lengthy distribution processes which can last up to 12 weeks and involve discussions with up to 100 potential investors. Syndicated loans and bond investors also require additional materials such as credit ratings and three years of historical financial audits. In addition, a public bond offering would subject a private company to the incremental uh, costs associated with SEC disclosure requirements. And lastly, management will need to engage with many more parties 
uh, as part of their quarterly earnings calls, as well as part of their efforts uh, to speak to prospective investors who may be looking at engaging in secondary market trading. The fourth and last benefit of I'll, I'll talk about is that direct lending is about relationship building. By having a smaller set of lenders, companies can develop closer relationships with their lending parties, which may prove valuable if, a business, if business challenges arise and the loan needs to be modified. Now, some have suggested that a single or small group of lenders could take a, com um, could take a small group of lenders could take a company hostage during periods of distress. However, this is far less likely to occur um, for several reasons. One, direct lending is a repeat business. If you take hostages just once, you'll be known as a terrorist and not a lender going forward. Two, direct lenders are in the lending business and not in the distress business. Telling your investors that you took over a company is not a good marketing pitch for a direct lender. And three, middle market companies don't withstand uh, periods of distress well due to their small size and lack of diversification. And as a result, lenders need to be more constructive with borrowers to avoid loan impairments and harming the performance of their relatively concentrated loan portfolios. In contrast, management teams with tradable bonds or loans could wake up one day and find out that their debt is now held by a group of distressed debt funds. And these funds may be focused on gaining of control of the company through a bankruptcy. These distressed funds can create uh, complications for management team's efforts to push forward with a rehabilitation program. To further complicate things, hedge funds may use the liquid credit markets to create artificial defaults, as Blackstone did with Hovnadian Enterprises. For many management teams, these risks are enough to encourage them to pursue capital from private credit providers. So given these advantages, you may be wondering, why do companies take any money from banks or the bond market? Here are a few reasons why. One is that companies need to reward banks with fees for showing them potential acquisition opportunities. This is particularly important for the private equity uh, firms who need constant M&A deal flow. Second is that companies need banks to provide working capital lines of credits. And closed-end funds are not well suited to providing these types of revolving credit facilities. And third, some companies have financing needs that are much larger than what direct lenders can support. Companies such as Sprint or Dish have high-yield capital structures that are over $10 billion in size, which far outstrips what the direct lending universe can address today. However, the direct lending universe is slowly catching up. In the past couple of years, private credit firms have been financing an increasing number of loans over $1 billion in size. This past fall, private credit firms lent over $1.8 billion to finance the acquisition of Gannett Company. While private credit firms are still far away from a one or $10 billion financing, it wasn't long ago that we thought a billion dollar financing would be a stretch. And given the growth that's occurring in the private debt capital arena, a $2 billion private loan financing may occur sooner than we think. So with, all, with private credit firms increasingly financing larger deals, will the private debt manager space continue to remain fragmented, or will scale and consolidation be the path forward? It's probably too early in the industry's evolution to know the answer to this question, but for now, both proliferation in the number of private debt managers and consolidation of managers is occurring. As existing managers continue to grow in size and focus on larger loans, room has been created for new managers to be formed to focus on smaller lending opportunities. As shown here, over the past five years, 20 to 25 percent of fundraises have been by new private debt managers and their efforts have been well-funded by institutional investors who have an increasing appetite for private credit. If these managers are able to perform, their potential for organic growth will be strong. Their growth and uh, evolution is likely to look like something on this diagram. 
On the left-hand side is what I'll call phase one, which is where a manager develops their first private credit strategy. And on this chart, it's a direct lending strategy. The manager will typically raise a closed-end fund from institu using institutional capital and originate loans to put into that fund. As their success grows, the manager will enter phase two and may try to raise not only an institutional closed-end fund to support their direct lending strategy, but also a BDC, a middle market CLO, which is just a version of a traditional CLO, or an interval fund. Now, by having multiple pools of capital uh, to support a single strategy, managers can increase their scale and diversify their fee stream. Eventually, the managers, if they're successful, will enter phase three on the right-hand side uh, and raise step-out strategies or niche strategies, such as a second lien fund or an energy fund, which will enable managers to leverage their existing origination, underwriting, and administrative infrastructure. Managers such as TSSP and HPS have successfully pursued these organic growth strategies and expanded the breadth of their strategy offerings. Now, an alternative tool uh, to all gr organic growth is M&A. Over the past few years, we've seen a very robust M&A environment for private debt managers. This slide shows some of the transactions that have occurred recently. Several common factors have been motivating these transactions. One being a desire by small managers to aggregate more capital in order to access the larger or less inefficient upper middle market lending opportunities. Second is an increasing need to improve operating leverage as new regulations and investor demands increase the cost of doing business. The third is a strategy by some very large managers to broaden their product offerings in order to better service large institutional investors. And lastly, interestingly enough, we're seeing forced sales by poor performing managers, especially uh, among BDC managers who are facing shareholder activism. Poor performing BDCs have created several interesting acquisition opportunities for firms like Oaktree. However, it's important to point out that we should all be concerned that in the strong economic environment and strong credit cycle, we're seeing signs of distress emerge in private credit. It's still too early to know whether these transactions will ultimately create as much value as expected. After all, transactions involving human capital are extremely complicated, and there, we don't know what kinds of surprises are lurking in these opaque private loan portfolios. Nevertheless, the number of managers for sale today suggests that consolidation will con continue, at least in the near term. And with that, I'll stop now and, and look forward to hearing your questions and thoughts. Thank you so much, Edgar. I was wondering if uh, there are any clarifying questions at this stage, because uh, Edgar and Steve had introduced the market, presented a lot of facts, uh, and before we move forward, if there is any question that, that uh, concerns clarity in the panel or in the audience, <laughs> then we'll just move. Oh, there is one on the back. I have a question. Uh, would there be a space to let on a revolving basis to smaller firms by the direct loan fund. I know you mentioned that revolving credit is not something yeah. that you would traditionally do as far as the middle market one when you do 100 million is concerned, but would you potentially tie up with a fintech firm and say probably offer a credit card to these lower or start a kind of company? Would that be a good business idea? Edgar, this question is for you, and before <laughs> you answer it, uh, I'm going to repeat the question because this is being taped and they can hear me better than they can hear the question from the audience. So the question is for you is that you split this into revolving credit belongs with banks, and the question is whether you envision this being eroded going forward through some uh, fintech, fintech application or perhaps even within fonts itself. Absolutely. It's, it's a great question and I appreciate it. I don't know if this, is, this microphone's on. Um, so 
just to clarify, so closed end funds you, that have it, use institutional capital, it's very difficult for us to provide revolving credit facilities because what we're actually doing mechanically is we're pulling capital down from pension funds or sovereign wealth funds. We're making a loan out to a company, but because it's a revolving line of credit, that company will potentially repay that loan back to us the very next day, but we don't have the mechanism to push the capital back to the pension fund or the sovereign wealth fund. And so that's why banks have historically provided uh, these types of facilities. Now, one thing that we are seeing is we are seeing an emergence of uh, fintech companies that are providing, uh, using technology to really streamline these proper, uh, processes. Steve was just mentioning his uh, son was working at Brex, which is one of those companies that does payment processing um, and looks at alternative ways of providing capital. We at Oak Tree actually funded a company um, that is looking at providing asset-backed revolving credit lines uh, to smaller companies as well. And the idea is to use technology to streamline those processes and undercut uh, banks in pricing. Excellent. Uh, Jeremy, your turn. Okay. <clears throat> well, thanks. Thanks very much, Victoria. Thanks for including me uh, in this panel. So what I thought I would do, I'm going to try and do something quite different than, uh, than, than Steve and Edgar, which is, um, you know, basically, I'm, I'm a, a bit of an outsider to this area, and I'm essentially a consumer of the, of the, 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 the sorts of uh, information that they've presented. And I'm going to try and use that to ask a couple of, I guess, quite basic questions. The first is, what does all this tell us about banks? So, and Steve alluded to this, um, to this question earlier, which is, you know, it's been drilled into our heads, in part by the banks, that you know, if we require them to hold anything north of, say, 10% equity capital, it's a disaster because equity capital in banking is so expensive. Yet, the, vehicle, the sorts of vehicles, these private debt funds, are in some ways akin to very heavily equity financed banks. So how can we, on the one hand, believe that it's impossible for banks to run with 10% equity capital or more, um, yet we can see the, some of these vehicles doing bank-like activity at 50% you know, uh, equity? What does that tell us um, about either the vehicles themselves or about the underlying? I think we have a better sense that banks believe equity is costly than exactly what the microeconomic friction is that's making it costly, and maybe there's a bit of a clue um, in, in all of this. And then the second question is, um, you know, think of yourself as a policymaker, and okay, so you've cranked up capital requirements on the banks. They were sincere. They really do find it expensive, and they're sincere. It's demonstrated that they're sincere in the sense that they are allowing their, as Steve said, they're seeding businesses, uh, they're seeding their business, and they're allowing stuff to go outside. And so that's one of the either features or bugs of regulation, depending on how you think about it, that you're going to have a smaller banking sector, all else equal, and a larger non-bank uh, uh, you know, intermediary sector, and how should you feel about it? And presumably that depends pretty heavily on the details of what this non-bank intermediary sector looks like and how it's behaving. So those are just the sort of questions. And by, by the way, to preview, I don't have answers to either of these, but, but uh, I will just try to ask uh, the question. Um, Okay, so just to sort of, you know, um, set the table, you know, what are banks doing in, in you know, they do a lot of things uh, for the purposes of this discussion. Think of them, you know, as kind of on the asset side, you know, doing information intensive lending. We have a pretty good theory of why we need to regulate banks. We think that because of some combination of FDIC insurance and credit crunch and fire sale externalities, banks don't fully internalize um, some of the risks they impose on the financial system, so we need to regulate them. On the, on the flip side, um, banks are regulated, but in exchange for bearing that burden, they get access not only to deposit insurance, but they get access to the Fed as their lender of last resort. And there's probably an externality here as well, which is when you tell a bank we're regulating you, uh, and you may be unhappy with it, uh, but you, know, you can always come to us, the Fed, um, they may not value that as much as sort of a planner would because the ability to do lender of last resort is sort of not fully internalized by the bank. It's sort of a systemic, it's a systemic plus. Um, so again, banks obviously view capital as costly. If you're thinking about it as a policymaker, uh, you know, there's a balance to be struck. I don't think in the United States, with this sort of incredibly innovative capital market, the balance is so much about you know, you worry that if you have too high capital, lending won't get done. I think the bigger worry is by whom will the lending get done? It will migrate and it won't, you know, it won't get shut off. 
And then I think the real, you know, where you come down on capital requirements ultimately depends a lot on how you think about where it's going and what, what if any, the risks are in terms of where it's, uh, where it's going. All right, so I just wanted to, I know the session is not so much about uh, open-end funds and CLOs, but I just wanted to kind of bring them into the discussion here because just as a way of kind of thinking about different um, leading examples and how you might think about what the um, root causes uh, or the, the sort of underlying frictions that make bank equity expensive. So first think about an open-end loan fund. Okay, so there's an open-end fund. It holds illiquid leveraged loans. So on the one hand, you might say, yeah, well, that's 100% equity financed. There's no leverage. On the other hand, the equity is demandable. Right? You, can pull, you can pull it out any, any, any day. So here I think it's not a deep, deep mystery if you ask how can you have 100% equity finance in a mutual fund. You know, one hypothesis would be a sort of neoclassical kind of corporate finance thing would be to say, well, the reason equity is costly in a bank in a, in a typical uh, commercial bank is there are agency problems. You know, the bank can do all kinds of crazy stuff. They can expand into other countries. They can do M&A. They can get into like arbitrage. And you know, that's kind of worrisome if you're a shareholder. And so there's an equity, there's a cost of, you know, an agency cost of managerial discretion. That's obviously very, very heavily limited in an open-end fund, both because the mandate is, is much narrower and because investors can pull the plug, basically. So in the same way that deposits or short-term debt might be said to kind of create discipline, there's a form of discipline in an, in an open-end fund. So maybe there's no big mystery there. Now, of course, that same discipline comes at the cost of they can get run on uh, or you know, they, can get, uh, they can get liquidated pretty quickly. But I, I don't think that there's a deep mystery about, how, uh, about this, this, this organizational form. Um, CLO, and what I'm going to say about a CLO would be true for for any kind of securitization. CLO, if you think about it, looks a lot like, if you just drew the picture of it, and Steve drew the picture, looks a lot like a bank, right? It has assets that are loans, and it has a capital structure. It's tranched, right? it has junior and senior claims. So it's like a bank. Uh, so what is the edge? Why do banks often securitize stuff? Um, again, I think really a big part of the argument is about limited managerial discretion. Some securitizations are at the extreme. They're basically just robots, right? They just hold a pool of loans, and management can't go in and do a bunch of stupid stuff after they've been set up. And so again, that might be you know, said in some agency kind of co context to lower the, the cost of capital. And even CLOs that have a bit more discretion, I mean, way to think about it, this is a stupid thing I have here, which is you know, you've heard of Jamie Dimon, you've never heard of whoever manages whatever CLO. Meaning, management is much, much more important. <laughs> with, 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 with all due apologies. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. That slide was better uh, when I was working on it three days ago. I'm sorry. Um, but you know, you know what I'm saying. That that, uh, or I think you know what I'm saying. That that you know, the the, the role of a manager is much bigger in a bank, precisely because they have so much more discretion, but that makes the thing a little bit scarier as an equity investor, and that might make equity, uh, might make equity costly. Um, again, I don't think, I, put it this way, if you'd, if you'd wake me out of bed in the middle of the night and said, give me a story of an open-end mutual fund, or give me a story of a, a, a CLO, I have a sort of off-the-shelf story. I feel like private debt funds, to me, as I understand them, raise a kind of deeper puzzle. If you're just trying to think about the corporate finance of banking and the corporate finance of these debt funds within the same kind of theory, it's kind of hard, right? Because, I mean, think about what they do. Uh, they make loans. They're largely financed. Now, it's a little ambiguous to me what if you, if you went across the industry and said, what's the average leverage, whether some of these funds have two to one or one to one. But I think we would probably all broadly agree they have much less leverage than a bank. And yet the equity, unlike with the, the open-end fund, is locked up. And Edgar made this point very uh, uh, clearly in his presentation. There's considerable discretion or there's considerable, I mean, it's, in some sense, it's a feature of these things that management can make, uh, uh, you know, quite a, you know it's quite a lot of decision-making authority. And that's an attractive thing, obviously, if you're the management. But that should be a thing that worries you all else equal as a shareholder. So how can these things sort of exist? And yet banks tell us that they just cannot survive with um, you know, more than 10 or 12% equity. So you know, the, the second part of the slide here is me just sort of grasping at straws. I don't, I don't know. 
uh, you're, you're sort of drawn to reach for some kind of a behavioral theory because the standard kind of agency stuff isn't working. Um, I was at a conference where this came up, somebody from Bain Capital was describing this and I asked this question and his response was, well, it's just different because it was sort of a categorical thinking type of response. He said, well, you know, obviously if you're an investor in a private debt fund, you're like a debt-oriented investor, so you're like pretty happy to get a debt-like rate of return. If you're an investor in JP Morgan, well, you're obviously like an equity investor, and so you're hoping for an equity rate of return. Um, that could be. Um, sort of relatedly, you might think that, well, what's nice about private debt funds is literally that they're private and the equity is not traded in a public market. And once you list yourself on the, you know, you're part of the S&P 500, you acquire all this sort of noise trader risk. And once you have all that noise trader risk, people have to be compensated for bearing it. So just the act of being public, uh, of being private, sort of lowers your cost of capital. Um, there's some work by Baker and Wergler, which is sort of in a similar vein, which is essentially saying the empirical security market line is flat. There's not much reward for beta. So if you're going to be publicly traded and hold a fixed income portfolio, which is relatively low beta, you better lever up or you're going to get gypped in some sense. Uh, you're going to be paying an awful lot uh, relative to what you should for your, for your equity. So maybe, maybe there's something um, behavioral going on that makes it expensive to be public um, in some way. But then the BDCs like blow up my theory. So I'm left, I'm, you know, uh, I'm left really, really puzzled. The only thought I have is if I can't sort of understand all these things with any single coherent story, should I think that maybe we're not in steady state here? In other words, they can't, they can't coexist in my brain, uh, you know, under, under the, the sort of the umbrella of a single theory. Does that mean, well, maybe we're not in steady state in the sense that we just have very different expectations, that right now the banks think that these loans are just not all that attractive loans to make. Um, you know, some of these other entities are making the loans, but at some point there's going to have to be some kind of a shakeout or a reckoning. Um, but this just isn't, isn't I, I don't know, I, I, I'm not claiming that there's a bubble. I'm just saying I would, you know, my inability to kind of come up with a sort of more coherent story makes me wonder if, if one ought to look down that, uh, that alley uh, as well. Um, let me say just a little bit about, um, you know, should you worry? Um, Doug Diamond has a great quote, uh, which I, I just love to put on slides, uh, which is that private financial crises are everywhere and always due to problems of short-term debt. Okay? So if that's your sort of, you know, if that's your beacon, I guess you'd say, well, you know, not everything that we see in the market, but a bunch of the things that we see in the market, pretty good. Pretty good. So, you know, none of the things I've mentioned are literally things that rely on short-term debt, whether it's open-end uh, loan funds, CLOs, or private debt funds. None of these look like they have sort of flighty, diamond divvig type, uh, type capital structures. So that feels good. Now, I think there's a pretty obvious caveat with open-end loan funds, which are getting to be pretty important, by the way. I think roughly the statistic is roughly 20% of the leveraged loan market is now held by either open-end loan funds or ETFs. Now, you know, on the one hand, you can say, and this is sort of a literal thing, you can say, well, there's no debt, so there's no short-term debt. On the other hand, the equity in these things, as I've said before, is immediately demandable, okay? And there's been some very nice research, both theoretical and empirical, which documents that there are what look to be first mover advantages. So if you pull out of one of these things uh, and they're holding 90, 95% of liquid loans and 5% cash, they're gonna redeem you out of the cash and so the NAV won't move, okay? But if enough people do this, eventually they're gonna have to start redeeming by selling some of the bonds. So it turns out that outflows today are predictive of future declines in NAV and so it looks like there's a little bit of a first mover advantage, okay? So, you know, if you, if you don't think about it too hard, you might say, geez, they've got uh, illiquid loans as assets and they've got demandable liabilities. Uh, that could be kind of like a bank and you could imagine some kind of fragility associated with that. So there I think, you know, Doug's quote notwithstanding, I think it's easy enough, I'm not saying that this is going to be an imminent disaster, but I think it's easy enough to get yourself to think this is something we ought to pay close attention to. Um, second caveat, uh, you know, even if you accept that Doug is 100% right about financial crises, uh, 
Um, you know, you can get a little too hung up, I think, based on sort of, you know, thinking about Lehman Brothers being the most recent thing, that what we really need to do, or all we really need to do, is try to, you know, um, is try to mitigate crisis probabilities, okay? You know, most recessions seem to have a fairly significant credit crunch component, and this is some, I, I just put up a graph from a recent paper by Baron, Werner, and Shang, which just makes the point um, that you can have really quite serious impactful in terms of GDP and unemployment pullbacks in credit supply that are not associated with anything that looks like a bank run, a panic, or any of that. Just because for, in, in their case, largely banks, you know, uh, take a hit to their capital and they cut back lending. So I think as, as, as a policy person, I don't think the only question you want to ask is what is the likelihood of a run or something that looks like a run. You want to ask what, you know, what is the inherent sort of resilience of the credit supply uh, arrangement we have. Um, so with that in mind, I, you know, let, let's ask kind of a limiting kind of question, just to sort of think it through. How would you feel, or how, how might you feel, if essentially the lion's share of corporate lending left the banking system and was in a, essentially in a collection of private debt funds? Okay, and again, I think the first simple answer, and I, I don't mean to diminish this, I think this is very important, uh, as an important piece of truth, is again, they're kind, for reasons we don't fully understand, they have managed to survive in this example as heavily equity financed banks. What's not to like? I mean, this has been the whole policy agenda, in some sense, has been to get more capital in the banking system, so. Well, if the banking system sort of decides it doesn't want to do it, and these guys want to do it, and they're like equity finance banks, maybe we should sort of declare victory. Um, okay, so that, that's the good side. I'm gonna raise some possible cons. I don't, again, this is not a prediction. This is, you know, this is just like, if I had to think, tell me a bad story, this is, this is me, my attempt to tell you the bad story, which is, again, it's not only, the not, the, 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 it's not the only question we should ask is whether these things can be run on. It's, you know, how stable and resilient will they be as credit providers in sort of down uh, economic situations. So, you know, we know that fundraising, for example, for PE can be highly cyclical. So what happens if a bunch of these funds just have really crappy performance, things are going bad, will essentially fundraising dry up, and their ability, they won't, you know, there won't be a run on them, but their ability to kind of... Uh, provide credit on an ongoing basis will be, will be compromised. And how big a deal would that be? And how should I think about, you know, what's the volatility of credit spreads in that situation? Now, here's a very important thing about banks, which I think is not always appreciated, which is, you know, people think about bank runs. Well, that's not what actually happens in the kind of FDIC insured world. What happens is when things are stressful, money runs back to banks, right? Or when the Fed cuts rates, uh, money runs back to banks. So banks tend to get big deposit inflows um, in times of stress. They're actually flush with funding, okay? So they can provide a pretty important stable. They're flush with funding. They have the FDIC. They have the central bank, right? So they're very natural intermediaries in times of, uh, in times of stress. And so, you know, if you think about a world where um, Banks are, let's say, doing 95% of the corporate lending, and there's a fringe of 5% of other stuff. If that 5% of other stuff collapses in a bad scenario, the banks are perfect for re-intermediating, because they're going to be basically flush with funding, they're already doing it, and they can step up and absorb 5% more. A harder question is if we've largely disintermediated the banks, Okay, so now, you know, it's the, the other way around, and 90% of the stuff is happening outside the banking system, and all the funding basically wants to come running back to the banks. Investors want to come running back to the banks in a stress scenario. Can the banks possibly, you saw a little bit of this in the crisis when the banks had to basically step up and take a lot of the civ assets onto their balance sheets. Okay, they had the funding to do it, but they started being quite capital constrained, right? So you can imagine if a whole lot has to come back to the banks, but the banking sector has shrunk, both in terms of capital and in terms of maybe the human capital to be doing loan underwriting, you know, they, they have played in, in past kind of episodes of stress an important shock absorber uh, uh, system, and now you've got the whole system outside of the regulated sector, which is, again, maybe good in terms of avoiding regulation, but then there's not the government support. There's not sort of the, the FDIC and the central bank that can essentially uh, buffer the system. Um, and I guess the sort of key point I just want to leave you with is that 
There's no mechanism, as far as I can discern, for the market to get this right. In other words, there is some, presumably some value to having deposit insurance and having a lender of last resort and having sort of a whole you know, structure that backstops the system. But when individuals are making a decision about do I want to do this inside the banking sector or do I want to migrate outside, no individual is sort of internalizing, well, it would be a good thing if I did something inside the banking system because then the banking system would be better able to kind of take assets back in a, in a, in a downturn. So I think at least in print, I don't, I don't mean to be sort of pessimistic, I mean, to, I mean to just sort of leave open the possibility that we shouldn't think that this is sort of all going to kind of shake itself out in the, in the best possible way. Okay, I'll stop there. And our last presenter, Todd Povino. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, so you might be wondering what I'm doing here, because I am, because you have Steve Kaplan, who's a, a pretty well-known expert on private equity, and Jeremy has great banking experience, and, and Edgar's putting out multi-billion dollar direct loans, uh, and I, I don't know anything about that. So you're sitting in your seat wondering uh, why I'm here, and uh, I'm sort of wondering the same. So I'll tell you what I think happened is about eight or nine years ago, we actually were doing uh, what we do. We do a lot of arbitrage type investing, uh, fairly large portfolios, but we saw an opportunity on the side, unrelated, uh, we saw a void in the market to provide direct loans. Uh, so we launched a small business eight or nine years ago uh, you know, that's done reasonably well. It's small though, it's, uh, and it does uh, some of the things that the questioner was asking about uh, uh, revolvers, basically. Uh, and I think that's the reason I'm here. So with that caveat, let me tell you my simple view of the world, uh, which, you know, the great thing about this is uh, I'm not presenting a paper and I did no empirical work here. I'm just telling you what I think. So take it for what it's worth. Um, so here's the way I think about it. I'm, uh, up on the left-hand corner is kind of, I used to think about it, uh, kind of how it used to be. Those are banks. And, and, and each bar there represents a loan, a different loan and each color represents a different bank. And so, you know, blue bank would have a piece of each of the four loans, and, and orange bank would have its different piece of the four loans, and, you know, they would make these loans and, uh, and, and hope for the best, you know, hope that the, the loans paid what they, what they were going to pay, but if they didn't, uh, you know, each bank would then take their respective losses. Uh, if you kind of, and so that's kind of bank direct lending. If you go to the, the lower right corner, uh, that's called more like this direct lending business, what, you know, kind of what's going on today. Uh, and, and those are funds or small corporations. I mean, you can structure them in various ways. Uh, but, but basically, you have fund A, fund B, and fund C. So now the, the bars are not loans, but they're actually funds. Uh, and you have the banks actually loaning money to these funds. And so now the bank might, you know, loan 50% of the capital to the fund. And then the fund might uh, issue some sub-debt actually some BDCs are issue publicly traded uh, convertible debt. Uh, and then there's some equity on top of that. Uh, and the important part about this is just, you know, when do, banks, uh, when do banks get hit? And so if you think about it in the bank structure in the, in the upper left corner, uh, banks are exposed to every default and, and if there's a loss, they're exposed to that loss to the degree it's in their portfolio. Uh, and uh, they, they diversify that, they're, you know, they're not stupid about it. They, they diversify it, they syndicate it to try and mitigate the losses. Uh, and then they hope that the profits on the healthy loans offset the losses on the bad loans. So it makes total sense. But if you look at the direct lending structure and you look at it from the perspective of the bank, uh, now the bank won't suffer any losses. Even if some loans in the fund's portfolio lose, the bank won't suffer any losses until the aggregate losses exceed uh, the equity capital plus the sub-debt. So the equity is uh, the first loss, and then the sub-debt is the second loss, and then the banks don't get hit unless both of those are wiped out. Uh, so in some sense, you know, the banks are, are, are safer, they're in a safer position. Uh, given the first loss position that the equity holders are in, uh, they're very active monitors. Uh, and so they're looking at, uh, often on a daily basis, what the financial health of their borrower is. And on top of that, the bank, by the way, they're not just you know, giving the fund money and doing nothing. Uh, they're actually monitoring the fund. So you know, a fund might loan money 
to a borrower on a revolving basis with some collateral as a borrowing base and calculate that borrowing base every day and then post that borrowing base to their bank who has their own borrowing base against the fund. You kind of have double borrowing bases and, and the bank will also put on, on the fund concentration limits and all sorts of other things uh, to try and make sure that uh, the fund's not taking too much risk. But by and large, I would say, you know, the two structures are different in the sense, not, I don't think they're different in the sense that the bank, uh, th that there's a risk return discrepancy here. I think the bank has just shifted to a lower risk, uh, lower return part of the structure. And they probably don't have to report uh, the number of losses maybe that they had to report before. So, so why has direct lending increased and, and the bank lending decreased? I mean, the demand for capital is clearly there. That there that it's a growing economy. There's clearly been a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions that they always you know, make good demand for, for debt capital. Uh, what about the supply of capital? And I think that's really where the story is. Uh, it, it, first of all, there's a regulatory burden on banks. And you know, the, the tier one capital ratio requirement, I think is a big deal. And, and probably it's a big deal uh, more in the denominator of that ratio. Uh, so that's where the banks have to risk weight uh, the loans that they make. Uh, and I think the biggest problem that the banks might face uh, is that they're uncertain about uh, what's going to happen to those requirements. So it's not, so uh, the, the bank will have to rate, rank each of its loans according to the riskiness, and they're going to have to explain to their regulators why they did it and what the rankings are. You know, if, if one loan goes bad, suppose you gave the loan, suppose the bank gave a loan a reasonably safe ranking, and then it went bad and the bank lost money. And now it has to explain to the regulator, well, you know, you know, it was just an idiosyncratic thing. It was actually ex ante a good loan, but ex post it was a bad loan. I think the worry from the bank's perspective is that now the regulator will say, well, you know, you did kind of screw it up on that loan. So why am I to believe that all the other loans that you rate or rank as, as safe are safe? And if the regulator changes uh, somehow the pressure on the bank, it can put the bank in a bind. And so we've seen situations just lending uh, where, uh, where, where the banks uh, might love to do the loan, but they pull back because they're worried about the effect it will have uh, on their uh, well, what their regulator will think. And, and, and they don't have a clear idea of what that uh, thought process by the regulator will be. Um, so I think what you're getting is I think the banks, uh, from my limited experience, have a little bit of loss avoidance going on. And that opens the door then for somebody else to come in and make loans. The other thing you had going on, uh, you know, at least a few years ago, is you had some major lenders exiting the market. CIT Group was a major working capital lender. Uh, they went bankrupt. They restructured, you know, at a, at a smaller level, but they went bankrupt. GE Capital dismembered itself and sold off all the pieces. Uh, and, and all of those things kind of caused, caused voids in the market where there was demand for debt, uh, borrowers were demanding capital, uh, but there was not a natural provider of the capital. But then, you know, interest rates have been close to zero, and then these BDCs and direct lenders come along and say, hey, you know what, I can pay you, you know, whatever, 8%, 10%, 12%, depending on, you know, what the, what the uh, vehicle is, uh, and, and that really attracted a lot of capital, uh, because where else are you going to put it? It's better than 1%. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, of the cost of direct lenders, uh, which I, I, I'm kind of surprised at it, but um, it, it's not just the stated interest rate. I think, I think if you probably took a look at the portfolio I'm involved in or, or Edgar's portfolio or, you know, or, or some of the portfolios of these BDCs that I put up on the screen, you know, they might tell you something like, well, the loan is at LIBOR plus you know, 3%. You know, floating rate, 3% above, doesn't sound great. But you know, then there's the monitoring fee, and then there's the unused line fee, and then there are amendment fees. And if you violated that covenant, we might take a warrant or two. And you know, at the end of the day, that really adds up to much more than LIBOR plus three or four percent. And and so if you look at some of these BDCs, what I just went on Bloomberg, I was just kind of curious over over ten years, what did the BDCs return? Like, what did if you invested in the equity capital of these BDCs, what would you have gotten on an annualized basis? And I was pretty amazed. I mean, the, the, I think those are really nice returns. And the, the average is 10% annualized. It's consistent with Steve's number uh, earlier, over a 10-year period. 
And, and then I thought, well, you know, the TPG one, the bottom one, the highest one, 15.5%, that's really, that's really pretty impressive. And how the heck did they do that? So I went and started reading their 10Q, their recent one. And I found this statement in the 10Q. And it said, uh, since we began investing in 2011 through September 30th, 2019, weighted by capital invested, our exited investments have generated an average realized gross internal rate of return to us of 18.6%. And what that means is that the borrower paid 18.6% uh, for that money. Seems very high to me. And I suspect that those borrowers would have rather been able to obtain bank financing, which I'm pretty sure would have been uh, at a lower rate. And I, we run across this as well. I'm pretty sure most of our borrowers would much rather borrow from a bank uh, than have to pay the fees that uh, that, that they have to pay us. But there's a bright side, and I think Edgar was alluding to it, that you know, maybe direct lenders are more nimble. Uh, and maybe we can react quicker. Uh, maybe we can help in workouts. Uh, so banks, you know, depending on the bureaucracy of the bank and the size of the bank, and maybe the loan's syndicated, so maybe it has a lot of syndicate members, and maybe the lead doesn't have a lot of authority. So if a company runs into hard times, and has to do a workout in that kind of situation, uh, it, you know, it can be tough uh, on the company. Uh, and it can also affect their regulatory ratios, which they're very concerned about. If you go to a direct lender, you know, workouts and amendments, uh, th those are often great profit opportunities because an amendment comes with an amendment fee. It may be a few warrants or maybe this and that and the other thing. And so I think direct lenders, although we'd really rather not end up with a bankrupt company, uh, we would like to have opportunities to increase uh, the rate of return on the investment. Uh, and, and the other thing is that I think direct investors, unlike banks, are willing to exchange for various uh, types of securities. So debt, other types of debt, uh, certainly equity-linked securities that maybe uh, banks would be unwilling to, unwilling to accept. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, the borrowers pay a higher price going to direct lenders is my guess. By the way, I have no empirical evidence. This is, I'm telling you my, uh, my sense of how things are working. Uh, so I think that direct lenders are charging a higher rate. I think they're providing something for that. You know, whether what they're providing is worth the rate that's being paid, that, that I have no idea. Uh, there was a question about how these things are going to perform in a downturn. Uh, and, and, you know, the. The way I look at it is really they're going to perform based on the cloud. These are, these are uh, typically first lien instruments. So it, you may, maybe they have a blanket lien on all the firm's assets. Or maybe if it's a revolving line, like uh, you were asking about, uh, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a first lien on the accounts receivable. Uh, and, and you're only loaning up to whatever, you know, 90% of the accounts receivable. Uh, so at the end of the day, how these things perform in a downturn is really going to be, depend a lot on the value of that collateral. If the collateral is good collateral, I think uh, these will be just fine. Uh, there's always the liquidity uh, issue that, you know, there were plenty of uh, instruments in the financial crisis that were good, money good, uh, but there was no money to invest in them. So, but, but that aside, um, you know, the underlying loans will be fine, depending on the collateral. I think the cash flow based loans, which I think are what more of the, the larger funds are doing, uh, those are a little bit riskier. It's easier to deploy capital based on uh, 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 cash flow, just looking at the company's EBITDA and saying, yeah, you know, we're willing to lend at that level. Uh, and so it's easier to grow a fund to a big size investing in those types of loans. If you get to the asset-backed uh, part of this, uh, the space, it's harder to deploy capital. It's much more um, uh, labor-intensive. It, it is being automated. Uh, it is being outsourced overseas, a lot of the tasks. Uh, and I think it'll get more efficient, uh, but it's harder to deploy capital as a result of that. Uh, it's safer, uh, but it's more difficult to monitor. Uh, so what do I think is going to happen in a downturn? I think what you're going to see is some, I think the asset back stuff actually will be okay. Uh, I mean, as long as people have uh, calculated the level of the collateral correctly. I think the cash flow based loans are where you're going to see some of the problems. Okay, so just uh, since this session really is about uh, posing some, some questions uh, for potential research, uh, big one in my mind is, you know, is bank capital more or less expensive? 
I, I, I haven't talked to a banker. I don't really know what the bankers are thinking, but, uh, but actually, after thinking about this a little bit, I, I'd like to talk to a banker. Um, and, and by the way, um, the, the bankers that we talk to are loaning to us. So they've decided to step away from that part of the business and, and instead provide loans to, to funds. So, so they can't give me any great insight. Um, uh, the other question, I think, is, you know, have the capital requirements, the capital ratios, the tier one capital ratios, have they pushed banks to be the indirect lender? So banks were direct lenders now, now they're indirect lenders. They're still lenders, they're still in the business, they're still monitoring, actually, a lot of the loans. Maybe, Jeremy, that helps a little bit in terms of the human capital uh, in, in, in a crisis. I don't know if the teams are big enough at that part of the bank to do it, uh, but, but they're still involved. Um, you know, are, are direct lenders more nimble? And I think there's, there's actually some room to do some research here just on workouts. Just the time it takes to do a workout. Uh, does it depend on the syndicate structure of the bank? Are the re recovery rates different for direct lenders versus banks? Uh, and can it be explained by just the principal agent problems within the bank? Because I think, you know, whenever you get funds and direct lenders tend to be small organizations. You know, maybe, you know, I, think, I think a deep organization is going to have you know, three levels, the, the portfolio manager, somebody, and then, you know, the head person, something like that. But a bank, you know, you could have 10, and the worst thing you can do is uh, something bad, so it's better to do nothing, and, you know, anyway, you know, that, that, that could explain a lot of what's going on with the banks. Uh, I'm also interested to see what's going to happen to uh, borrowing costs. So borrowing costs for the borrower, uh, and, and then yields obtained by the investors. And I think that there's been some compression uh, in the last couple of years. And I think, you know, as, pe as more funds have come in, you've seen yields, especially in the commercial and industrial space, uh, get compressed. I think there are some niche products that are still have very widespreads, but I am interested to see as more and more providers of capital come in, you know, what does that actually do to the cost of capital? Uh, and then obviously, you know, I, I'm not hoping for a downturn, but I am kind of curious to see uh, how, these, uh, how these debt instruments, these, these privately uh, run debt funds perform uh, in an eco economic downturn. All right, with that, thank you. Thank you. Edgar, may I draw on you for the clarifying question? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Todd raised, uh, pointed out that the cost for borrowing from VCs is in 18% plus. And this creates a picture where uh, bank lending and at least borrowing from BDCs are extremely separated. So they're not stepping on each other's toes. More broadly, when we think about private debt space, uh, so, so I understand that it will be more expensive, and you raise the reason why it should be more expensive. There is a flexibility, there is a certainty, and several others. But to what degree, if, you, if you're going to put a premium, the extra cost that it takes to take a loan from private debt uh, provider, uh, what would be the numbers? So how do we reconcile this 18% versus buying lending costs? So um, I get asked this question quite often from potential uh, pension fund. <coughs> potential investors like pension funds, uh, typically you get an illiquidity premium associated with just a private loan of two to 400 basis points depending on, on the loan. Um, TSLX, uh, which Todd was uh, referencing, which is T, um, TPG's uh, specialty lending uh, BDC, is a little bit of a different flavor of a BDC because they do a tremendous amount of dip lending, debtor in possession lending, rescue lending, bankruptcy financings. So they are really starting to look at loans that are much, uh, much different, more unique, more like a special situations fund than a traditional direct lending fund. Um, and so that probably explains some of that 18%, um, uh, that high rate of, uh, of return there. And the other piece um, to note on um, direct lending and, and what uh, folks like TL TSLX or other BDCs do in their numbers that they present publicly is you're capturing underwriting fees in their OID, original issue discount, um, other sorts of um, amendment fees in there which are being aggregated up, which are inflating that number. So when you actually look at an, an apples to apples comparison of private debt versus a traditional bank financing or liquid markets, you're usually getting 2 to 400 basis points. And, and I would add two things to that. I mean, these things are leveraged, right? So they're not what they're getting. You know, if you take LIBOR plus six or seven hundred is what the company gets. 
if you're leveraged one to one and you're borrowing at LIBOR plus 250, you're going to end up at the fund level getting you know LIBOR plus 1100 or something like that. So the leverage is a, is a big kicker there. But Steve, I don't think the leverage affects the 18%. That was their IRR. That was their internal IRR calculation. The leverage actually affects that, the equity return. Was that return. their internal IRR? That was their the internal IRR. On the, on the equity or on the No, no, on, on all of the loans that they made. Okay, then I'm, then I'm incorrect. On yeah, that's I think the, the typ internal the typical IRR. typical fund that goes out there, though, is when they, when they present that 10% net IRR, that 10% net IRR number that I showed you has the leverage baked hmm. into it. So what the, what the firms are actually facing is typically not... 10 or 12 percent it's typically more like seven or eight can, can i maybe just add to add something when, when i was saying I, I think it's exactly todd's kind of comment that made me wonder if we're in steady state by and what i mean by steady state is that everybody has a shared consensus view on what expected returns are on the underlying loans right and so the differences can be explained by kind of structural differences so it's hard for me to imagine that whether it's 18 percent or something a little bit different that a bank is looking at this thing and saying, oh yeah, I agree there's an 18% return, but I'm just staying away from this because of my high cost of capital, right? Because think about it, even if you had the most extreme non Medigliani Miller view in the world, you say, well, equity capital costs like 10% more than debt capital, okay? Well, then on 10% equity requirement, that should add about 1% to your overall cost of making the loan. So there's just no way that that has nearly enough explanatory power to have the bank turning down something, whether it's 18% or whatever. So it sort of almost must be, you're forced to back into the view that the banks must be looking at these loans and seeing them as not as attractive in some sense as, as, the, uh, as the current experience might suggest, that they have some other. And so then, you know, something is gonna have to true up. Either the banks are gonna learn that these really are such good loans and then they're gonna have to figure out how to do more of them, or the private lenders are gonna realize that they, after they've had a bunch of defaults that 18% was sort of the realized return, but it wasn't the expected return. So I just think we're still in a lot of flux. We, we almost must be in, in, in a lot of flux. Mm -hmm. I, I, if I can just add to that, we're definitely in a, in a period of flux. I think a couple of things. Oh, sorry. There. Um, a couple of things to think about related to some of the numbers that Todd put up on, on uh, rates of return. One that was over a 10 year period, and it's something that we joke about quite a bit. If you look at any of these BDCs, um, uh, what you'll find is that the returns on their loans that they made in 2010, 11, 12 were spectacular. We were coming right out of the financial crisis. Banks were capital constrained. Uh, high yield, the high yield market was still repairing itself. We didn't see a big boom in the CLO universe of the leveraged lending market was just starting to repair itself. And that was really where BDCs really started to step in and make great returns. If we look at those same numbers and we did those calculations over the last two years, for example, you'll see that the returns are much lower. Uh, and we have seen that trend continue on. Part of that is the markets have just become much, much more competitive. So that delta between what a BDC can earn on its underlying assets and what banks earn today is, is much, for, uh, it's much more compressed than what we've seen in the past. The second thing is that BDCs, um, and, and if you look at the universe, we've been talking about private debt, but if we were to break apart the private debt universe and we looked at direct lending, which is typically loans to private equity sponsors to finance acquisitions, and then we uh, put that as one category. And then we look at um, uh, opportunistic loans or rescue loans or dip financings as another category. The return profiles are completely different. And that list of BDCs, um, what you'll find is those BDC managers, uh, many of them do very different types of loans. Um, and if we were to look at, for example, Golub, or we dug even more into Aries in their more recent periods, you'll find that the return on the underlying assets are much, much less than 18 or 14 or 12 percent uh, today. In fact, if we look at the BDC universe and the return on equity these days, we're typically seeing somewhere around a 9 to 10 to 11 percent type of returns, and that's on the levered equity. So that tells you the underlying assets are generating much less returns than they historically have. Mm -hmm. Should we take some questions from the audience? <laughs> Well, if you have a question, you raise your hand. Otherwise, we can, we'll keep going at it. So you discussed that length of the change since the financial crisis, basically, or since the beginning of the 2000, about the lender universe 
pertains to uh, this shadow banking environment. We've also mentioned, but not so much, there's been a big change in the borrower unit. It used to be companies borrowing directly from banks. Now you have private equity firms are really the ultimate borrowers uh, in this universe. Many of these <coughs> private debt deals are private equity sponsored transactions. My question for any member of the panel is in a stress macroeconomic environment, do you see private equity borrowers behaving differently than the corporate borrowers have I will, you know, sort Steve, of... Steve, can you briefly repeat so the let question? So let me re repeat the question. So the question is basically more of these companies that are being lent to uh, by, by both the banks, but particularly the, the BDCs and direct lending funds or private equity funded companies. And what you've seen over time is this big increase in private equity and private equity funded companies. And so the question is in a downturn, are they going to behave differently and this is where I'm a little bit more sanguine, uh, I'm, I'm sanguine, I'm, I don't know if I'm more sanguine than Jeremy was in his remarks, is that, you know, number one, we had the worst financial crisis uh, in, you know, 70 years or, or more in uh, 2008, and the mortgage market was a disaster but the corporate loan market and the LBO market was not a disaster. That, that was not where the systemic issues were and it worked out reasonably well. And going forward, you have the direct lending funds more than the banks, which I think are less, gonna be less hit uh, in a crisis by uh, a credit crunch or by uh, runs. And then the other thing that you've got lurking is you have a lot of dry powder with the private equity funds and with the direct lending funds. So when you do get into a crisis, or not a crisis, you get into a recession, and it's unlikely to be at the uh, depths that it was in 2008, 2009, you actually have an ability for people who know these assets to come in, and if the prices get too low or if they're uh, distressed to put more money in, and those investments in 2008-2009, as you know, we just heard, turned out to be very, very good investments in the crisis. So I'm a little bit more sanguine in that sense in that you do have all this private capital. It's very informed capital about these companies. And when you do have a downturn, that capital is gonna come into play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to add to that, that Todd raised something very important, which is lending to the alternative investors themselves. That includes private debt space, but also private equity has become more common uh, and is increasing. However, we should be clear in that he didn't mean to imply that the space of the credit has been, the banks no longer lend to, fir to firms and primarily lend through the vehicles. Uh, let me give you a concrete example. Think about leverage loan market. This is exactly where the buyouts live, right? And buyout is the largest space within private equity. About 25% to 30% of the leverage loans are to buyouts, meaning that the rest actually has nothing to do with this alternative space, right? So in that sense, uh, the, the, the uh, borrowers, composition of the borrowers had not changed that dramatically. It shouldn't be thinking about the banking sector as the ones that step to lending now to the alternative investors. It's more the fact that the alternative investors are pushing the, uh, the boundaries of, of uh, where private debt, uh, private debt is the main, uh, the main lender. Any other questions? I believe it's Michael Roberts. Oh, no, perhaps not. <laughs> it's very hard to see who, who, who is speaking. Uh, I'm, I'm Louisville with the uh, New York yeah. team in Toronto. Um, I know you mentioned that uh, direct lending is, is growing basically by themselves. The sense that I had beforehand was that banks had an edge because they have access, they have their toes dipped in multiple other businesses, so they have access to a lot more clients. How do, so, so my question is basically, how do direct lenders compete with uh, the, the, the banks in terms of access to clients, how, who, who 
how do they find these clients and, and what, where the partnerships can, can be leveraged? And I'm going to repeat this question as what is the edge of private debt providers in sourcing their, in sourcing their deals sure. as so, compared to banks? So just in terms of how many of these firms are set up, um, many of these firms have dedicated origination teams, and their sole job is just to go out and hunt for opportunities. Um, one of the... Um, what I call sort of great innovations of private debt many years ago was uh, Ares actually figured out a little bit of the special sauce of how do we get a good return on human capital here. One of the big challenges um, in the private debt universe is you're going to have to employ a tremendous number of professionals to find these opportunities. So how can you do that very efficiently? And they really uh, um, pushed into the area of focusing on private equity firms who would be repeat issuers in a year. Um, if you think about a general corporate, non-private equity sponsored firm, they may do one financing every five years, but private equity firms may do anywhere from three to ten deals a year. A year. So if you focus on that one private equity sponsor, you may have a chance to do ten financings in that year, and you'll have one origination professional covering that per, uh, particular private equity firm. Um, and so they've done a great job of getting out there, building up those teams, and, and uh, to, to find those opportunities. Um, and that's why you see most private uh, debt funds or, or direct lending funds focusing on the sponsor universe as opposed to the non-sponsor universe, which is one of the areas where there's still a lot of white space uh, are the non-sponsor backed companies. You know, I mean, yeah, we're kind of in a niche business, but, um, but I would say, you know, if it comes to competing with a bank, um, uh, if it, uh, the economics are better for the borrower to go with the bank, typically. So we have to source our deals again internally. We have there's a sourcing team that that does it, but but there but the banks aren't sleeping. And and what we're doing is competing more more against regional banks. Uh, th their economics will typically be better, but oftentimes they're not there. They're not there because uh, you know we're loaning to companies where if you looked at them. Uh, you wouldn't put your money there, right? You, you would say, "I'm not, put, I'm not investing in these guys." But, but it's because the collateral is good, and, and unless you have that mentality, uh, you know, the bank won't go for it. So I think there is something to the, you know, the banks do have an edge up. They do have relationships and different products and things that they can sell the, the, the borrower on. Uh, but they may not have the appetite for the type of loans that some direct lenders are willing to make. Mm -hmm. But this, I mean, that sounds like a bit of a segmentation argument that, you know, what you're doing are loans that the banks won't do. The banks, you know, will be more averse to doing loans that are the sort of LBOs of middle market firms where you have five or six times leverage or EBIT, leverage is five or six times yeah. EBITDA and the banks might just say, I don't, I don't want to You know what, I there. think the banks want to do it. I actually think the bankers want to do it. And actually, we've had interest in you know, portfolios from banks. What, what, who, the person who doesn't have an interest are their regulators. So it gets to a certain point, and then the regulator looks at it and says, uh, what are you doing? And then the deal dies. And so I think that's kind of where it's falling apart. But, but the banks, you know, they, uh, they're not missing that. So, so this is very interesting, because then it sounds like it's regulatory, but it's not capital regulation. It's something else. It's like it could be, for example, in Steve's ex example, it could have been the leverage lending guidance, mm -hmm. which sort of for a time was just impinging on deals that had uh, debt to EBITDA of six times or something like that. I mean, interestingly, that has since been gutted because uh, there was this ruling that basically said that the leverage lending guidance was a form of regulation and it had to go through the whole regulatory kind of review process. So if that's true, it's an interesting hypothesis because as time passes, the banks may be back to being more willing to do stuff because it feels like it has to be something other than well, just 10% capital. Well, 10%. well, my sense is right now is that if it has negative EBITDA, they have no interest. So you could have uh, you could have 10 times covered in collateral, but if it has negative EBITDA, it's a no-go. And that's, a, that's sort of a, some regulator's rule of thumb? That, that, that's my sense yeah. of some regulator's rule of thumb. Take it, take it for what it's worth, but that's what it seems like to me. When, uh, when the Shared National Credit Review Program was in place and uh, there were a tremendous number of non-passing loans that were uh, uh, not being funded by banks, um, you know, one of the things that we saw was that um, many private equity firms that were buying companies that had negative EBITDA uh, were having to go to the private debt market. So if you were to look out and, and even just Google, go to Vista Equity. Hmm. 
is a firm that does software deals, and they have about $50 billion of assets under management, so they are a very large private equity firm. Um, they almost exclusively have used uh, the private debt markets over the years because the types of businesses that they buy, while they're very fast-growing businesses, just wouldn't uh, qualify under the Shared National Credit Review Program, and therefore uh, they couldn't go to traditional banks to get that financing. The other thing that we've seen, at least, is that many banks that we talk to say they, over the years, because they have gotten out of the business of lending to certain types of businesses, they actually enjoy uh, or, or prefer providing portfolio lever levered mm -hmm. loans. So they'd actually prefer to provide the loans to the BDCs that back lever those portfolios, or uh, uh, buy CLO tranches, or provide loans to closed-end funds, because from their perspective, the capital uh, charges are much less, and they get a full diversification of the portfolio, and they get exposure to the type of underlying collateral that Todd or others may be doing without having to go on to that uh, out on the risk spectrum. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mark Carrier. So 20 or more years ago, banks liked to make loans to firms that were the risk equivalent of triple D or double D. That was where the vast majority of their portfolio loans were. They make some single D loans. And you know, what I'm hearing is that that has not really changed that much. And yet, you know, there's talk of regulation being the cause of the rise of the private lenders. Um, so I'm a little skeptical of the regulatory explanations as the cause of this. If you were a single D risk or triple C risk borrower 20 years ago, you had to go to G. or to uh, you know, another finance company. So we heard earlier that the finance companies are gone, but the sort of overall tone of what you all know are saying is it has the ring of there's just a lot more single e risk borrowers in the economy and triple C risk borrowers than there used to be. If that's the case, it's not surprising that banks are not doing it, because they never did. So to repeat these questions, let me try. Mark, please correct me if I get it wrong. Uh, but you're saying that uh, the, the way we painted private debt market is that it's in the risk space where banks never were active. And so, yes, finance companies out, and so that's eaten by the uh, uh, CNHs of the world. But uh, largely, you see the expansion of private debt as going into this high risk territory as opposed to really taking on the bank business. And your concern is that this is something to watch out as a result of just the risk profile. Is that the fair description of your question? It sounds like there's just a lot more borrower demand. Yeah. So, 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 so you might be right. I mean, I, I can't say that you're wrong. I, I, I told you before, I have no empirical evidence for any of this, just, just anecdotes. But, but the one anecdote that I, that I kind of hang my hat on is the opportunity cropped up at a funny time in 2010 and 2011. So, you know, maybe at that time there were just a lot more single B and double B borrowers. Maybe that just happened then because of the financial crisis. Uh, and then that'd be consistent with what you're saying. Uh, it seemed to us that there was a real uh, stepping back of traditional lenders in that space. Uh, so it's something that we hadn't seen before. You, you're, what you, I think what you're saying is that's because all the borrowers, they were at Triple B in, you know, in 2007, but in 2010 they were single B and double B. And so that's why we had all sorts of opportunity. No, that, that could be. Um, my, my sense was that actually it was the other providers of capital that had, that had stepped back. <laughs> Probably underlying your, your statement in some ways is just there's an increased need for lenders to provide riskier lend, loans to riskier companies, and, and I'm sure there's certain a, a certain amount of that definitely happening today. It's part of what uh, is leading to some of the uh, disparity between the rates of returns that banks earn on their underlying loans versus what a private uh, uh, credit firm uh, can earn on their underlying loans. I think the other thing, though, is and to, to, to segment two concepts here. One is banks can make loans to hold on their balance sheet. They can make a whole loan and hold that $100 million, $200, $300 million loan if they so chose on their balance sheet. 
Most banks don't do that today. Um, in order to produce a higher ROE, they are syndicating that loan off. They may hold the revolving debt exposure in a small amount of that term loan, but they are moving a tremendous portion of that loan off of their books and pushing them to mutual funds and CLOs. One thing to consider is that CLOs are now the biggest buyer in the loan market today. And the way that CLOs work, because they are really looking to, uh, they have stringent requirements because they are so levered that uh, it's difficult for many CLOs to buy a tremendous amount of single B loans, especially when the market's weak. You can see that in this last quarter in Q4, we actually saw there was a very tough time, or I should say Q3, it was a very tough time actually finding buyers for single B loans in the syndicated loan market um, because there was a fear that you would start to see these downgrades pushing companies into the triple C bucket and uh, forcing many of these CLOs to actually have to start selling loans into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the back. I couldn't tell you whether it's going to be the steady state each year. It seems like we think it's steady state and it comes down a little bit further and further and further. Um, I don't know if the uh, two markets will actually converge. Um, it may be that uh, the liquid markets actually become even more illiquid uh, than they are today, which may actually cause them to converge uh, in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Steve, you've been working on the performance of private equity for a while. You must have a view on the liquidity premium. <laughs> Do I have a view on the illiquidity premium for private equity? Well, you view, not, you, not you, exactly. let me put it this way. You argue that private equity asset class uh, has an alpha. A, a contra view to that would be that that's an illiquidity premium. So I would say historically, private equity appears to have had an alpha. Um, whether that's an illiquidity premium or whether that's because they're actually adding some value, I think is a, yeah. a religious type discussion. And I mean, there's, there's an argument on the private equity side that for a, an illiquidity discount, I guess you would say, because remember what happened in the crisis is that if you were holding public equities, a lot of people panicked and sold. Yeah. And if you were holding private equity, you were stuck and you were much better off being stuck in 2009 than selling. So it, it really is a religious, I like to say it's a religious question and I, I don't have a good answer. But you know, you know, I actually have a comment on that because when you, Edgar, when you said the 200 to 400 basis points, I thought it was pretty interesting because, so we, we, we most of what we do is arbitrage stuff, so merger arbitrage. And we actually, so we did a lot of research back in 2000 and wrote a JF paper about merger arbitrage. And the conclusion of that paper was that there's a liquidity premium in merger arbitrage. The reason being that uh, when a merger is announced, you have a lot of holders of the equity, and on Monday morning when that deal's announced, you know, they might want to sell it. They own, their mandate is to own long equities, not to own some funny merger stock. So they all want to sell on the same day, and somebody has to be there to provide them liquidity. Who does it? Well, that's what ARBs do. And, and so we looked at the data, and we said, well, it looks like the liquidity premium is 400 basis points. Uh, and, with, and we decided to launch a fund, and we told investors, you know, it looks like the liquidity premium on this is, you know, 400 basis points. And now, and we launched that fund in 2001, so we have a lot of data. And ex post, it's been about 300 basis points, which, you know, is a little bit off of the 400, but also risk-free rates been down to one. So I think that there's, I don't know what it is about 200 to 400 basis points, liquidity premium. I sort of think that's right, that if investors are gonna be locked up or, you know, have to provide this liquidity, that's about what they're going to demand, somewhere in that range. All right. Um, I had uh, returning to financial fragility. Uh, so Jeremy raised this point that uh, one of his concerns is uh, that there are not he was questioning the governance mechanisms. In particular, he highlighted the fact that there are not many obvious market mechanisms that would make uh, private debt investors disciplined. So I wanted to gather the views of the rest of the panel on what do you think as the governance structure of these uh, vehicles. So let's embrace the fact that they are becoming important. How, 
how do what what structurally prevents them from loading up on lots of risk and uh, fundraising is of course an important point because their performance will be uh, will determine their fate and unless they can raise the next fund they cease to, cease to exist however that's a very low frequency event right because there are big uh, big periods of time in between fundraising so I'm not sure if that is enough in itself so I'm not sure what's your views on this on the Jeremy's point about lack of market discipline, or did I misinterpret it? I, I, I think I was. I meant to say something a little different, which is not, I wasn't questioning the governance of the funds. I was questioning whether the market outcome, in terms of the fraction that's in the banks versus the fraction that's sort of, whether the market outcome is sort of what a planner would like to see. That there's no pricing mechanism that gets you to internalize whatever benefit Fair. there is of being kind of in the government backstop sector versus not. That would be true even if the funds are perfectly governed or sort of, uh, you know, first best governed. I see. There just may be too many of them or too few of them relative to what you would want. That, yeah. But nevertheless, <laughs> if somebody would question the, the governance mechanism. But it depends on the structure, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, if, you know, if you own the equity, you're going to be very careful about what type of loans you make. Right. And, you know, if you're just getting fees on a fund, well, you own the equity effectively because if you screw it up, you're not going to get fees for very long. And, and the value of your firm is the discounted value of the fees. Uh, so if you screw it up by taking some crazy risk, uh, you know, your terminal value went to zero. Uh, so I think there's a pretty good incentive not to not to screw it up too badly. Right. And heavily levered banks should be well performed by that logic, right? Because they, they, they're holding levered equity. Well, do, how, much, how much equity did that? So I, there's a big principal agent problem. Uh, so I think that there's, uh, I think in the, there's less of a principal agent problem in, in, in the direct lending funds than there is in a large bank, is my guess. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, any reactions to each other? Clearly you had uh, very different views. I, I was wondering if... It's particularly Jeremy. Jeremy's views, he was puzzled by the fact that they... Uh, by the by the by the structure and why banks cannot raise uh, equity at any uh, at at reasonable cost yet this structure feel abstract from anything else appears to be able to run at a very low leverage. I, th I think that Jeremy raises really good questions, and every time I tried to explain what I thought, he said, "Yeah, but what about?" <laughs> and, I, and I had no answer. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, I appreciate the the questions, and there's a lot of room for thought. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question, I think, for, for both Edgar and uh, Todd about what kind of returns their investors are looking for. Are they looking for debt returns? Are they looking for equity returns? What, what, what exactly is it? Well, it, so just, to, you know, our, our direct lending fund is, is pure, uh, purely, the equity capital is purely financed by a proprietary capital. So we're looking for uh, high returns with no losses. How's that? <laughs> and, and that steady state, right? All your days <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, when I, when I talk to um, pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, um, the, the return expectations are all over the sun. Some of them are using private lending as a replacement for high yield bond funds or levered loan funds while other um, uh, investors are really using private debt right now as a short-term replacement for private equity. And one of the challenges that um, pension funds are facing these days is that there's been a tremendous amount of money that's been raised in the private equity world that has not been deployed. And private equity firms are finding it extremely difficult to deploy that capital. And as uh, these pension funds are sitting on a lot of undrawn capital that they thought would be put to work, they're trying to find alternative ways to put that capital to work and have started to look uh, towards uh, uh, the private debt funds. Um, you know, historically, uh, these fu uh, these uh, funds have produced returns anywhere from eight to twelve percent on a levered basis, and so that gives you a sense of probably where pension funds are thinking returns will hopefully be in the future. Um, but like I said before, we've been coming out of a financial crisis that was very deep and very painful, and so. Uh, the historical returns are probably not a great predictor of where returns will be uh, going forward, especially as we've seen uh, tremendous yield compression uh, in the markets overall. Mm -hmm. So, um, any, qu any last questions from the audience, perhaps? There's two on the back. We're going to start with 
My first question is, uh, I think Tom mentioned that some of the uh, changing the structure in the, mar in the shadow banking lending is because investors demand for higher yield. I wonder how much that has to do with the low yield curve. And a follow-up question is, uh, what do you guys speculate on uh, how the shadow banking system and the traditional banking system react to monetary policy, which one will react Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just going to briefly repeat the question. So monetary policy, clearly we are in a very special environment where the interests are very low. And so to what degree this phenomena that we observe is a result of the low interest rate environment? And more, perhaps more importantly, what would happen if my this uh, low interest environment come to an end? Which in personal view is very unlikely. But. <laughs> So, so if rates would revert, anybody on the panel? I, I think if rates revert, you're going to have less interest in the space. I think that, you know, when your alternative is, you have a bunch of cash and your alternative is one and a half percent. And then I say to you, well, look at, you know, you could put your money over here and it could make, well, you know, the sub debt maybe it could make 9%, but uh, the equity capital could make 13% and it's secured and it behaves more like debt than equity. Uh, it's a very attractive thing. If you, if you let the risk-free rate go to 6 or 7 percent, I think uh, you're put, you would have to push up the yields on the debt to the borrowers to a level where it would be hard to deploy capital and investors in the funds would have less interest. The, the delta would be lower and there would just be less interest to invest. Mm -hmm. I, think it was a, I think it was a driver. It's a driver of, uh, of the growth in the space. So that was a question in the back. I had a thought about um, your partnership structure has something to do with it. So these, these uh, private uh, private debt funds, the, the partners essentially can't get out. They're stuck. They have to hold, they can't sell their stock. They got skin in the game for the long term where bank executives who own stock periodically they can sell, they get to cash out. And so this ability to cash out early is, versus not to be part of this puzzle. I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. The practitioners and the it seems reasonable. Again, I, I think you may run into the same problem I did in my attempt at grand rationalization, which is then, what about the BDCs, <laughs> which are just, you know, publicly traded, right? I mean, <laughs> as you try, try to string together a theory that can explain two of them, then it kind of crashes and burns on the next. Uh, yeah. They're publicly traded, but they do have similar incentives, right? They do mm -hmm. have the, Maybe. the management fee and I think some carry, correct? Right. Now, of course, banks, banks is a big spectrum because they're a big, you can think of sort of big publicly traded banks. You could think of smaller banks that have kind of more concentrated ownership structure, and we've been kind of painting all of them with the same brush uh, as well. So, you know, some of, the, some of this line of questioning might lead you to think, is the right structure for a bank to change the compensation, to give them more, you know, kind of locked up equity, but it wouldn't necessarily take you all the way to, you know, private debt fund. I don't know. So, uh, I'm curious, how much of the uh, high return on equity, do you think, uh, for banks is just due to that banks, as, as much as asset managers and private debt funds, it's a little bit amorphous to really understand what's going on in a BDC. It may be expen exponentially that much harder to assess the risk of a bank. And you know, I had an investor the other day tell me, you should really take a look at Donsky Bank, the big Danish mm -hmm. uh, bank, which is um, um, undergoing a, a US investigation. Um, and it, it, it reminded me that with banks, they're such a big black box, and there's this real fear that someone inside that bank has done something wrong yep, that's going to cost them significant amounts of capital that we wouldn't necessarily see in a BDC right. because we're just making loans. And that's right. It. Exactly. You can't decide to open up a branch in exactly. God knows where a stand. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, yeah. right. Exactly. Right. So I had one more uh, clarifying question, I guess. So the entire time we were talking about uh, debt investments that are done from the funds, uh, uh, and one parallel development is, of course, the fact that a lot of uh, limited partners or a lot of institutions with long-term liabilities have been investing in the alternative space directly. So any numbers, however vague, and this was Steve's original point, that numbers are very vague, but all those very vague numbers would need to be adjusted by the fact that there, is, there are also a lot of pension funds that, or endowments, or sovereign wealth funds that are trying to pursue 
these uh, investments on their own. And of course, my understanding is that the insurers actually have been very active in the direct lending even before the financial crisis, which also would need to be, uh, we would need to adjust our numbers for that. Now, my understanding also is that for pension funds deciding to pursue the investments directly in the alternative space, that actually happens to be the space where they feel most comfortable with, because they have hire a whole bunch of bankers and, and deal with it that way. And the sourcing process is a little bit easier, as well as the fact that there is no active component exposed. And so it's, my impression is that the, if now the phenomenon of pushing of into direct investing by this ex-limited partners is big in itself, and it's skewed toward that. So as you think, so we painted a picture of this developing private debt space, which is actually rather large, and it's, we painted it as being driven by the uh, financial intermediaries, uh, I mean, pensions are arguably also financial intermediaries, but by the general partners. But uh, where would you put the pensions and where would you put insurers in this picture? How would you add them? Do you see them directly competing? With, in which space they're directly competing? Which, where, or is this completely, dif it's a slightly different phenomenon? No, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great question. Um, uh, pension plans and, and insurance companies uh, are sometimes competitors and, and sometimes partners. So if you were to go to an Allstate or a Northern Trust, or not Northern Trust, um, Northwestern um, Mutual. Mutual, thank you, um, uh, or AIG, they all have very large internal private debt teams now trying to source and find opportunities. One thing that's, that's unique about pension plans and uh, insurance companies is they also make very large private equity LP investments. Mm -hmm. And as part of those investments, they typically go to the private equity funds and tell them, we're giving you our investment, but we want the opportunity to invest in your debt. So every time you give a, do a private equity transaction, mm -hmm. we want to see the debt financing deal. And they have a lot of comfort of financing those deals because those insurance companies are already in the equity through their LP investment. So if they don't like the credit, they should be really concerned about their LP uh, position in those private equity <laughs> funds. And so there's this sort of uh, um, uh, diligence that's already been done on the manager and the, the hope and, and a, an expectation that they've done the right amount of uh, work in, in purchasing a company. The big, I think, fallacy of that, though, is um, it's debt versus equity. And with equity, uh, you can make one down, or you can lose one, and then you can make three, four, five times your money. In debt, the best you can do is maybe make 1.2, 1.3 times your money, but you can lose all of your principal capital. And there is this asymmetric risk bias um, in, uh, in, in debt versus private equity. And if, if insurance companies and pension plans believe that if we've already underwritten the equity, we should like the debt, they have to remember there's a portfolio theory here. Um, and it's one thing that private credit managers don't do relative to banks is we just don't run as uh, diversified of a portfolio. And so when a loan goes wrong, its impact on a portfolio, and this is true even for pension plans and, and insurance companies, the impact on their portfolios is much more dramatic uh, than it would be for a bank or other diversified organizations. All right, well, this is all the time we have today. I've learned a lot. Thank you so much, this was great.